So I'll, I'll talk about, uh, I, I guess I'm charged with giving a little bit of an introduction to um, Floquet systems. And then after doing a little bit of that, I'll talk about uh, uh, some recent work that I did with Ivar Martin and Bert Halperin uh, on double, double frequency drives. So it's really fun to be here. So I'd like to thank the organizers, but I guess I don't see Victor here yet. So I'll wait until he comes and, uh, to say that. But, uh, what? <laughs> I want to thank all the organizers. <laughs> In your case, it's organizer and host, right? right. <laughs> All right, so let's start. So uh, I guess we have an infinite amount of time for this talk, so please stop me with questions. Uh, otherwise, I'll just move it on to the next speaker. All right, so let's see. So when I wake up in the morning and I think about what I want to do when I go to work, I like to think of myself as doing something very substantial. I go down to the construction site and you know, build up some Hamiltonian. So to do, to do a nice Hamiltonian, then we need to, uh, well, we don't really use trucks. We use uh, theorists uh, to go do this work. We, as the tough theorists, work with all their might. We bring in some hopping. We bring in some uh, interaction terms. We bring in some potential. And we construct some Hamiltonian. And you know, once you take a look at the Hamiltonian that you end up constructing, you always end up unhappy with it. There's always something missing. And if you're a, an advocate or a disciple of uh, Floquet philosophy, then in order to fill in for what's missing, you say, why don't you take this nice construction you made and just shake it? And if you do that, maybe you can get things to work the way you want. For instance, Maybe you can shine some intense light on it and turn your system into a topological system with nice edge states going around it. Or <coughs> maybe you want to do some other things. And so this was, this was the architectural view of Floquet topological physics. Here's the more solid state view of Floquet topological physics. You can shine some light and turn like a semiconducting uh, band structure into a topological band structure. And this was, of course, uh, this was something that uh, got me started in this field. And it was work with Nathaniel, who will talk about some things like that in, I guess, after lunch, if he shows up. I believe he's supposed to show up. Uh, this was work with Nathaniel and with Victor. And there are many, uh, several other groups that were uh, doing similar work around the same time on topological Floquet phases. Now, this is a bit of an advertisement of the things that I was interested in in this uh, Floquet field over the last five years. So another thing that we did, and you know, there's still two days in the conference, so please feel free to uh, ask if you want some more details about this later on uh, in the conference. So after thinking about uh, topological Floquet phases, <coughs> I got involved in the idea of using uh, uh, combinations of light and matter systems in order to produce topological polaritons. That was with Torsten uh, Kartik, Charles Bourdin, and also with Nate Linder. And lately, uh, some, some developments I was involved in uh, related to anomalous Floquet topological phases. And these are phases that can be topological, have topological edge states in two dimensions, but do not have any mobile states in, in the box. So in a sense, you have a totally localized system, no, uh, topolo no static topological index, but still have topological edge states going around it. <coughs> and I won't take away the message of this uh, kind of phases from Netanel, who will talk about them. Uh, now, another thing that's interesting in this uh, kind of systems is, of course, the question: if you take your if you take your uh, system and shine very intense light on it or shake it, you might be concerned that it'll just go on fire. So, if I were you, you know, there's a talk about. So K drives, uh, no, it's not, it's not delivering a very reassuring message to say that you want to take your system, shine intense lights on it, or shake it. It'll, you know, it might eat up. So another line of thinking in this field was uh, whether we can have a driven, top, a, a driven system uh, still behaving like a semiconductor at low temperature. So can we get like thermal s steady states for this? And my angle on this work. Uh, 
In my angle of this work, we thought about taking a semiconducting system, driving it, and try to see what conditions are necessary in order to keep it as a low temperature semiconducting, uh, as a low temperature uh, thermal state effectively. And uh, together with these gentlemen, Kartik, Charles, Nate, and Mark Rudner, we realized that you can actually take your driven system, couple it to an environment which has a phonon bath that's specially tuned uh, relative to the Floquet gaps that appear in the system. You can also couple it to uh, a fermionic system <coughs> the <coughs> to an energy filtered lead, and that would produce actually thermal looking low temperature steady states. Now, this was more of an advertisement. So if you're curious about any of these things, catch me in the lunch break or coffee break, or ask me in the infinite question period after the talk. Uh, but now I'll do my duty and tell you a little bit more of the background uh, of uh, Floquet phases. And uh, so, <coughs> so this the first thing to think about is if you have a periodically driven system, instead of instead of diagonalizing a Hamiltonian, you have a Hamiltonian that's different for every uh, instant in time. And so you have a constant piece in the Hamiltonian and a periodic piece in the Hamiltonian. So you can't just diagonalize this. You have to diagonalize something else. And that something else is the Floquet operator, which means the evolution operator over a period. If you do that, instead of energy eigenstates, you end up with quasi-energy eigenstates. <coughs> Sorry. And these quasi-energy eigenstates uh, emerge uh, in the following way. So if you diagonalize this unitary over the period, you end up <coughs> with eigenvalues that are roots of unity. You take the log of these, and you get an energy. But because of the period of the drive, that energy can only be in one interval of between 0 and omega, where omega is 2 pi over the period. Now, that interval is up to you to choose. It could be minus omega over 2 and omega over 2. It could be 2 omega to 3 omega. And it doesn't re really matter which interval you choose. They're all gauge, uh, gauge equivalent to each other. So this is the mathematical perspective on Floquet theory. Here's more of the solid state perspective. If you have a semiconductor with a valence band and a conduction band, and you irradiate it or modulate it periodically, the zeroth order effect is that you're going to create degeneracies in the system <coughs> between states of the same momentum that are separated by h bar omega. The zeroth order thing you should do is just a rotating wave approximation. You bring the two bands together. And then you resolve the degeneracies by opening a gap. Now, in the case of the Floquet topological insulator uh, construction that I hinted at before, this is pretty much how you create a bend inversion. Uh, and you get a topological phase with ed states just from this simple construction. But if you really want to make an honest to God Floquet theory for this, you need to also consider higher photon resonances. So for instance, you can have now two photon resonances. We already shifted the bands towards each other. So now the next, the higher order resonances, like the two photon resonances, would emerge when you try to uh, see what states can be connected by another h bar omega. So you see there's a degeneracy over here. There's a degeneracy over here. This can also uh, be resolved. And you can have more and more resonances, which you can produce by just uh, uh, replicating your band structure. Let me show it again. So we had one replication of the band structure by the rotating wave approximation, but now we can make more copies of our bands at h bar omega from each other. And every time that we see a crossing, that's going to be some uh, n photon resonance. So for instance, here, those are the one photon resonances. Here we have two photon resonances. I think at some point I had the patience of uh, resolving all those uh, degeneracies. So here's the one photon gap. Here's the two photon gaps that can open up. And then over here and over here, there's a three photon gap. But I think I became too lazy to resolve that resonance in this slide. So that's the solid state perspective. No, I did. <coughs> yeah. This is the solid state perspective. And as you can see, what we end up with, no matter how hard we try, uh, we'll end up with two bands as similar to the two bands that we started with, right? Uh, a lower. Uh, a lower Floquet band and an upper Floquet band. Now, <coughs> this, is, this is something that uh, results in a lot of confusion in the sense that when you see something like that, you don't really know 
which band is a lower band and which band is the higher band because you can always make your window of uh, uh, energy eigenstates, of quasi-energy eigenstates, be in a different uh, segment that's omega, uh, that has the size omega, but it could be between minus omega over two and omega over two, as I did here, or it could be between zero and omega, and that leads to the doubts as to whether you can terminalize this kind of band or not. Uh, all right, so, so that, that's pretty much what I wanted to say about the mathematical introduction to uh, Floquet okay phases. I'll give you a little bit more of an introduction as I talk about the double frequency drive, but I wanted to ask any questions so far on this uh, wake-up call type Floquet okay introduction? The vision, by, by doing that, every, you know, that the real exchange, the heat, real heating of the system, the long period you basically take out. Yeah, exactly. So, so one thing that uh, comes up when I, when we give talks about Floquet is people ask whether we're not just hitting the system directly by giving it a lot of photons. But you see that giving single photons doesn't really matter because if you have an electron sitting in this state over here and you give it a photon, it'll just come back to the same state. So you eliminate that completely. Heating processes come in for the following reason. So if you have an electron sitting somewhere, say, in the lower Floquet band, it can actually emit a phonon or something like that, go down, but actually going down means going up to this state. So if you think about this as a semiconducting uh, band structure, it's very uh, feeble, it's very uh, susceptible to heating just by you know, spontaneous processes of emitting things, but then absorbing a photon from the drive, and that's responsible for heating. Also, interactions are a big issue because if you have two electrons, say, interacting with each other, say an electron here and an electron here, they can split the photon between them. So each one of them can go, say, half a photon higher in energy. So an electron can go from here to here, correlated with another electron going from here to here, and again you get heating. And How uh, important is the rotating wave approximation? It's not very important. So here I eliminated this uh, rotating wave approximation effectively. So the, the, trick, the trick, I think, in getting this effective Floquet band structures are just to make um, copies of your band structure at h bar omega from each other. Every time that you see a crossing, resolve it, and then take a, a window that's uh, h bar omega large in energy space. Other questions? Anything that bothered you about Floquet phases and you didn't want to ask so far? Is there a when, when we use our, <coughs> we drive our atoms to make it less stable. But but then you also see some you know, very very different other conditions popping up. Mm -hmm. So this will, only the, yeah. this will be like higher photon resonances, yeah. though, right? Yeah. So so one can there's one thing that's not shown in this figure, which you can which you can put in, which is how much overlap you have between the original band structure. Uh, between the original band structure and um, the Floquet states. Like, the Floquet states might, be, uh, might have a very strong overlap with a particular state in the original band structure. And then you can say, well, <coughs> there, it's not, you, ca you can associate more of an energy with that state, which is the energy of the original state. So if you have a weak drive, you can do that. And that's why uh, rotating wave approximation is good because you, have, you can associate your states with the original states except for where the resonances are. If you have a strong drive, you cannot do it anymore. You have a lot of harmonics. And I'll talk about the harmonics in a second. All right, so after this haphazard introduction, <coughs> let me use uh, the time to talk about uh, something that I've done recently with uh, Ivor Martin and Bert Halperin. And uh, we were joined by Frederick Nathan, who's, this, who's a star student from Copenhagen, working with Mark Rudner. And you know, as if a, f a single Floquet drive, a single uh, modulation of the Hamiltonian is it enough, we decided to see what happens when you have uh, uh, a system driven by two frequencies, see when something interesting occurs. Uh <coughs> All right, so let me give you an overview of what's uh, to happen next, I will try to give you a little bit more introduction into Floquet. I will talk a little bit about topological phases as well, and then combine these two to show you how using periodic drive, or double periodic drive, you can get a topological phase not in 
one dimension driven or two dimension uh, two dimensional driven system but in a zero dimensional driven system so a two dimension an effectively two dimensional topological phase we manage to realize in a zero dimensional system just a spin driven by two frequencies what effects will we get out of it we'll get quantized pumping between the two drives and uh <coughs> and the ability to convert energy from one frequency to the other. That will be the topological effect that will emerge. And after we'll see how to do this just with a spin driven by two classical beams, I'll show you that there are even more interesting effects that can occur when we put our spin in a cavity and use one classical drive and uh, couple the spin to a second, uh, photonic, to a second uh, photonic mode that will be treated fully quantum mechanically. All right, so more Floquet introduction, just in case. So as I was saying, in order to solve a Floquet uh, Hamiltonian, Floquet quantum system, let's again look at something simple, Hamiltonian that has a cosine drive. <coughs> when we look at the time evolved wave function, we know that we can write it as a superposition of many harmonics, right? So a sum of uh, exponent ion, ion omega t for all n. Now, if you take this form and plug it into a Schrodinger equation, here's what you get. It looks a little long, but really what we have here is Schrodinger equation with the constant Hamiltonian, and then tight binding terms that connect these psi ends with their neighbors. Extra photon or one photon less. The price you pay for this construction is that there's also a constant force term that appears, but that's just a counter that tells you how much energy you took from the drive. What's the number of photons that you took from the drive? Nonetheless, nothing stops me from describing Floquet problem as a problem of hopping on the lattice where the coordinate is the photon number. And this is essentially a synthetic dimension, a tight binding model on an effective extra dimension. Now, if I do this, I need to start understanding uh, what's the correspondence of motion on this lattice and the way that we think about motion in a regular uh, system with space and momentum. All right, so, <coughs> so let's see. So if, if we think about, uh, about this photon space and try to compare it with the uh, real space, the good thing to do is to take the drive and add a phase to it. Now, if you think about what the phase does when we think about the wave function of the Floquet state, every time that we have an n omega t, we need to add n phi. So if you want to know what the number of photons that the system has, what's the location of your system on the synthetic dimension, it's very easy to do because you just take a derivative with respect to phi and you get uh, the n pop up. So photon number operator is just i d d phi, as you would expect, right? It's the same kind of uh, algebra as in Bose-Einstein condensates. And this is in, in direct analogy of x being derivative with respect to momentum. Now, in fact, if we, if, we looked at, if we look at this analogy, why not just take this omega t plus phi and turn it completely into momentum? But I'll do this in a sec. I guess I forgot I need to tell you that in this case, if you want to know what's the photon absorption rate, you need to take the time derivative of this. That's the same as com commuting it with the Hamiltonian. You need to figure out what's the expectation value of the commutator of dd phi and h. And this is in direct analogy of the commutator of h and the uh, Location operator, DDK. So far, so good? All right. So if you take this phase versus momentum seriously, let's just uh, change omega t plus phi into calling it k. And now, I don't know about you, but I come from a solid state background. This comforts me because I can write a Hamiltonian that's time independent that just looks like a bent structure. Right, it's like some. Uh, H naught plus V cosine K. Except that I need to pay the price of having an effective force that tells me that if I go to the right on my end space, I took more energy from the drive. Nonetheless, I can think about, uh, nonetheless, I can think about my Floquet state as some kind of, uh, uh, as emerging from some kind of a band structure that's given by HK of psi K equals epsilon K psi K. N dot is d d phi of h, 
so is the commutator of dd phi of h, and we see that in this case, it's analog uh, to just the group velocity in this effective bend structure that I'm, that I'm advocating. Questions? All right. <coughs> now, before I go on with this construction, with this analogy between the number of photons and space, <coughs> let me give you some caveats. Well, first thing, if I think about the Hamiltonian like this that has momentum states and the band structure, then you might say that I, I can't really access all those states. In fact, if you think about this Hamiltonian, it's just a spin half Hamiltonian that's driven. So a spin half Hamiltonian that has a k that depends on time, then your Hamiltonian just addresses a, a, a system with two states, right? Just spin up and spin down. So how can I have like as many k states as in a band? Well, you don't. Uh, so in fact, you can't really access all momentum states. Your k just moves constantly across the Brillouin zone, and you end up with a Hilbert space that still has two states. So the dimension of the Hilbert space is really just the dimension of this operator, H0, or the operator V. So for instance, if you have a Hamiltonian for spin half, you can imagine it being like this, say, A sigma Z, gives you spin up, spin down with two different energies. The drive would be, say, like uh, a sigma X term, so V cosine K sigma X, that will give you a band structure that looks like the familiar valence band conduction band. But instead of having a full band of spin half uh, states, <coughs> really the, uh, the force term is going to make the momentum wind right, across the Billouin zone constantly. So you don't have access to individual K states, but rather what you have is a periodic motion in this band structure, which is also associated with Bloch oscillations in the sense space. Now this was a hard, a hard animation to do, but I you know, took the extra step and made the Bloch oscillation happen together in momentum and real space. So I'll show you that for a slide, for a sec. So this is how it goes. Yeah, that's a, ver that's a very good question. I think that's the next caveat that I'm going to give you, which is if you want to use this, uh, if you want to use this uh, band structure construction, then you want to have your frequency much smaller than the Hamiltonian, than the band gap between the, well, let me show this on this slide. So you have a band gap that emerges here, pretty much h minus v, right? Or twice h minus v. <coughs> in order to stay in the lower band of this construction, you have to have this motion to be slow, right? I mean, <coughs> in general, you can solve in this basis. Here's, here's your wave function. It's a superposition of the up band and the low band. And this psi up of t and psi down of t give you the language in which you can find your Floquet eigenstates of the evolution operator. But if you start with the psi down being 1, psi up being 0, and you want to keep it that way across your cycles, you want to have the drive being slow. That's what I'm saying here. If omega is much smaller than, say, the, uh, the constant term of the Hamiltonian that gives you the gap, <coughs> then when you start with a, with a super particular superposition of up and down states, you'll stay that way as long as omega is small, and you'll just evolve each eigenstate on its own uh, energy over the cycle. So this corresponds to having your spin direction S of t following the Hamiltonian, following the magnetic field in the Hamiltonian uh, over the cycle. And this, of course, happens if the magnetic field is larger than the frequency of the drive. So it will be the, sm the, uh, the slow drive, strong coupling limit of Floquet. Now, of course, this animation is not really good because the rotation here looks just too fast, right? So really, in essence, I want this rotation to be slow compared to the uh, effective magnetic field implied in the Hamiltonian. You still with me? Questions? All right. So as the second caveat, if you want this uh, band structure analogy to hold, you want the drive to be slow and strong. All right, so so far with one dimensional, so that's it with one dimensional, okay. Now we want, now I would like to ask the question, can I make the same kind of construction in two dimensions? And nothing stops me. 
from writing a drive that has two frequency in it. This should be thought of as two momenta, but I'll, I'll drive this home in a sec. <coughs> so I, I can write a Hamiltonian like that as a Hamiltonian of two momenta, k1 and k2, kx and ky. And now there's a force that's associated with number of photons that you took from one, from a first, uh <coughs> sorry, number of photons that you take from one drive, number of photons that you take from a second drive, and the wave function, you might as well expand in, the, uh, in terms of the harmonics of both of these drives, both of these frequencies, like so. This you can describe as an effective tight binding of Newtonian on two dimensions. It has this particularly ugly form. But all I have here is a Schrodinger equation for a wave function that's, <coughs> that if you wish, as a, uh, is defined on sites n1 and n2 of a two-dimensional lattice. You have hopping in one direction, hopping in the second direction, and a force term. In terms of the lattice view of this, the wave function is just defined on a two-dimensional lattice and subject to a force whose direction is just the vector omega, omega 1 in the x direction, omega 2 in the y direction. Now, you may wonder what makes a double drive really a double drive. Of course, there are two cases that we should consider. One case would be uh, if omega 1 and omega 2 are rational to each other. Say, for instance, omega 1 to omega 2 is like 2 thirds. In which case, if I think about this analogy uh, to two space dimensions, Really, if I take uh, three photons of omega 1 and then give up two photons of omega 2, so if I go, <coughs> if I go say, three steps over here and then two steps down, I end up in the same place, essentially. Right? Or maybe I should do it right. So if I take three photons of n1, but then I give up two photons of n2, I should end up with the same energy, right? So actually, I need to have in the space, instead of going three photons in one direction, two photons down, I should end up in exactly the place where I started, namely over here. That means that uh, if I have a commensurate frequency ratio, really I don't have access to this full two-dimensional space, but rather it's like flattening of a nanotube, right? Some periodic, uh, periodic boundary condition in the direction that's perpendicular to omega. And what it looks like in terms of this momenta, k1 and k2, uh, which are really the phases of the drive. I start at some place in this uh, floquet brillouin zone, and then as I evolve in time, I start off moving that way, but then due to the periodicity of the brillouin zone, I keep, you know, I keep crossing its edges, and then after uh, three times the, the period of the, slow, um, of the slow drive, I end up exactly in the same place where I started and I end up exploring the brillouin zone only along these lines in the same way that in a, say, carbon nanotubes, you only explore momentum states um, along discrete lines of the two-dimensional brillouin zone. If you really want to explore the entire two-dimensional brillouin zone, if you really want to have a full two-dimensional system, you want to have incommensurate frequency ratio. There should not be any rational number that corresponds to omega 2 over omega 1. For instance, there could be the golden mean, in which case, <coughs> in which case the same picture looks like this. As you evolve in time, the two phases, you go to the Brillouin zone, you cross once over here and then to here, and then after, after um, three times the slow period, you end up just barely missing where you started, and then as you continue doing this, you cover more and more of the Brillouin zone. Now, a lot of us are thinking about, uh, you know, we would like to hear more about time crystals. Uh, this is a time quasi-crystal, if you wish. So quasi periodic time. Is it a time quasi crystal or are you just driving it off the incommensurate? I'm just making it. Responding. Well, there's no real time quasi crystals in the normal experience. Okay. So they respond in different quasi periodic ways? I don't know if I'm sure. No, we will do that. We will do it. We will do it. Quasi time crystal. <laughs> All right, anyway, so, <coughs> so if you want to actually have this full two dimensional analogy, you want to have the incommensurate case, or as I was saying, the time quasi crystal. But of course, I'm just driving it. I don't have any emergent uh, uh, time crystal phenomenon here. Uh, 
All right, so enough about Floquet. Okay. It's time to talk about topological systems. So in the past, I used a lot of, uh, so when combining this periodic driving with topology, you know, the, the go-to model for me was always the BHZ model, the Benovic used Jang model. No reason to stop now. Here it is. So Benovic used uh, Zhang model is a two-band model with strong spin orbit coupling. You have a spin half that moves, uh, that moves in a spin orbit uh, coupled lattice. It can hop uh, on the x direction with a sigma x associated with it, in the sigma y direction with, uh, in the, sorry, in the y direction with a sigma y associated with it. And there's also a sigma z term that has a constant term associated with it and also hopping, real hopping in the x and y direction. This has the form of the Pauling matrices dot, a three-dimensional vector that's a function of two-dimensional momenta. <coughs> and if you think of the, um, if you think of the unit vector that's associated with this vector of two-dimensional momentum as n, if you want to know whether this is a topological band or not, what you need to ask is what this n is doing, what does this n do as a function of the two-dimensional Brillouin zone? It turns out that the sigma xy, the Hall conductance of this model, is just the number of times, is proportional to the number of times that this unit vector wraps around the unit sphere as a function of two-dimensional momentum. More mathematically, sigma xy is given as this integral over the two-dimensional Brillouin zone of this Pontryagin form. <coughs> but what sits here is really just the Berry curvature. If you have a Berry connection in this band, you take a curl of it in terms of the momentum coordinates, you get the Berry curvature. This is what sits here. And this is just the integral of the Berry curvature, the dual magnetic field in the band. And what am I doing here? This is, I'll show you in a sec, this is proportional, this integral is just proportional to the churn number. And you can now ask as a function of the parameters V, B, and M, when do you have a topological phase? When do you have a wrapping? And when do you not have a wrapping? You can ask about the band structure setting M, say, at 2 and varying B1 and B2. You'll get a, you get a phase diagram that looks something like this. If B1 plus uh, B2 uh, exceed M. <coughs> if B1 plus B2 exceed M, you get a topological phase. If they don't, you stay in the trivial phase. And it's important for me to show you this in this diagram that if you keep, uh, say, B1 constant and change B2, you can go in and out of a topological phase. And this will become important when we try to quantize one of the fields, in which case, these amplitudes become proportional to the number of photons in the mode. But you know, this, is, this is a funny way of looking at the phase diagram. We're more used to thinking about it in terms of uh, something like this. If this uh, gap M over 2B is smaller than 1, you get topological phases, which are a number uh, that is just the sine of M, plus 1 or minus 1. But then when you exceed uh, 1 in this ratio, you go into trivial phases. All right, <coughs> questions about the BSZ model? You've all seen this before? Maybe not? If you want to ask questions, please, please do. So no problem. All right, so typically when we think about this band in the context of topological insides, we think about a band that's full of electrons and, has, and therefore has a quantized all conductance because it adds up contributions from all momentum states. We don't have a full band. We have just a single particle moving in this band structure under a constant force. So we need to think about a quasi-classical motion in this. And again, let me define the Berry, curve, the Berry connection as you know, this momentum derivative of the eigenstates in each momentum k. The curl of this is the Berry curvature, the analog of the magnetic field. And then the equation of motion for a particle in such a band is given as r dot is just the group velocity with respect to the, the momentum derivative of the energy plus the curvature cross the force. This is just the dual of the usual uh, uh, Newton law of um, you know, the, the PDT equals to the force, which would be grad of potential plus magnetic field cross the velocity. This is just the dual with replacing momentum and space with each other. 
<coughs> so now if I want to think about the motion in a band due to this equation of motion, you, can, you need to think about the map of Berry curvature as a function of momentum in X, momentum in Y. This is an example of the Berry curvature map for non-topological phase. This is with m equals 4, while well, each of the b's is 1. This is an example of a topological phase where m is 1.5, the b's are 1, so the ratio of, of m to 2b is less than 1. <coughs> And now, for instance, if in this band structure you apply a force, so in the right direction, you know, in this space, our, cis, our spin is going to just move on the horizontal, um, in the horizontal direction across the Brillouin zone. But at the same time, this very curvature term is going to move it in the y direction. So let me see if I got the animation right. It goes something like this. And the point is that you can have motion in the x direction that has to do with this uh, band structure, but then over a period, this will always give you Bloch oscillation, but this will give you perpendicular translation. That's where the sigma xy is coming from. All right, so now it's time to combine this knowledge of the uh, two-dimensional B at Z model with the idea of the double drive and just change the momentum in the x direction with the first drive, momentum in the y direction with the second drive phase, and there you go. This is a zero-dimensional Hamiltonian of a spin half, just driven by two beams. So you can imagine having your spin half driven by two elliptically polarized beams that propagate in perpendicular directions, one beam in the x, z direction, and another beam in the y, z direction. An elliptical because v and b don't have to be the same. In all of our simulations, we took all the v's and all the b's to be one, uh, but that's besides the point. So, all right. So, this is the model that we want to look at going forward. We want to use all the all the intuition that I was trying to construct in the past twenty minutes or so. <coughs> so, one thing is this is the equation of motion in this uh, uh, spin orbit coupled band. Here's again the Berry connection, what the curvature is, and a reminder that when we say k, we really mean the phase of the drive. So the k dt is omega. It's like the particle is always subject to, to a force in the direction of the vector omega. All right. So if I, if I take this and translate it to motion in the photon number space, then we have the n dt equals, <coughs> uh, and well, there's a term missing here. So if we want to translate it to the n dt, this term, when we average over a cycle, will disappear, and we'll just end up with this term. So really, we'll have the NDT equals the Berry curvature, the average Berry curvature, times omega in the other direction, right? This is a sigma xy. Th this is a whole type conductance, the whole type motion. So every time that you push in one direction, you'll get motion in the perpendicular direction. So the NDT is just um, the perpendicular to the surface cross the omega vector, cross the force times the average curvature. And the average curvature is just the churn number of the band over 2 pi. Now, the quantized sigma xy then <coughs> implies that you just have a universal uh, motion, a universal rate of motion to this two dimensional photon space. And that means that if you ask how much work is done by drive one or drive two, how many photons are taken or given away by drive one and drive two, it's given by the average, the average Berry curvature times omega one times omega two. Why? The velocity in this photon space is, so dn1 dt is the Berry curvature times omega two. But if you want to know how much energy you absorbed or gave up, it's dn1 dt times omega 1. And that gives you this omega 1, omega 2 times the average curvature. Sorry, there's a square here that shouldn't be here. Questions? All right, this is a more graphic way of presenting this. So we have this motion in a two-dimensional photon number space. We have a force along the omega vector. And therefore, the motion in this space goes in perpendicular direction. So photons are taken away from drive two 
in this case, and given to drive 1. Of course, we have conservation of energy, so omega 1 dn 1 dt has to be omega 2 dn 2 dt, which is uh, fulfilled because the motion is perpendicular to the omega vector. And really what this means is that the quantized sigma xy that we have for the B at Z model translates into quantized energy pumping in this doubly driven system. And again, the quantization is the chair number over 2 pi and times the product of the frequencies. So that's really the effect, the topological effect that one gets when you have strictly temporal topological phenomena. Now, you can think about it as energy pumping. You can think about it as frequency conversion. You have two lasers coming in. They hit your system. They, they hit the spin, the, 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 the spin half. One laser comes out depleted. The other laser comes up strengthened. And independent of the frequency ratio between them, this pumping effect will prevail. So you can have conversion between any frequency and any other frequency, as long as you can realize this model. Yeah. Because we think about this if you plot on serials, so you, you now take a plot in that is plot the number photons in the large and you have to contain photons. But in principle, the logical effects are robust. So by numbers at some point this has to stop. Say when the number yeah, so we don't stop. And also another thing that uh, you think it is sort of consistent with thermodynamics, because from this argument it's not clear whether it's important how many photons you have. So in particular, you might have N1 much less than N2 holes with numbers. And then you sort of pump energy from hole to hole. Ah, so this is a totally uh, non-equilibrium situation. So you can actually do this. You can actually pump. I mean, you don't. When you have like cold and hot, what you'll have is uh, a frustration. I think what you'll have if you heat up the system is you won't be able to initiate the system into one Floquet band. Right, so in order to get the pumping in one direction, you have to be in the lower energy quantum, the lower energy Floquet states or the upper energy Floquet states, but not in the superposition of both. So that's where thermodynamics would come in. You will just have, so, so let me parse your question again into two pieces. One, can I discretize photons? The answer is yes, I'll do it in a few slides. Will I look at quantum photons? I'll show you in a few slides what happened. But then the second question is, can I have pumping, can I have pumping in, uh, in a system that's thermodynamic after I heat it up? And the answer is no. But the way that this answer comes up is the following. If you have a two-dimensional band structure of a BHZ model, right, then this whole conductance, this uh, whole response, applies in each band separately, right? In one band, if your electron is found in the lower band, it'll move like this. If it's in the upper band, it'll move in the opposite direction, right? So you have to initialize your spin to be in one of these uh, uh, momentum states, either in the higher energy or the lower energy, but not in a superposition of both. So if you end up in a superposition of both in the density matrix, then your you, you effect will average out. I guess my question is the importance of you can initialize the same yeah, if both of the thermal, if both of the thermal, then I think you might be able to do this. But it's not a thermal dynamic engine, it's a pump. Alright. So we're getting this exact quantization if all the Brillouin zone is covered. Alright, so in order to show that this works, we need to actually simulate it. So let's do a simulation. Uh, what we need to calculate is the work done by each one of the sources. To calculate this work, practically what you need to do is ask, take the term in the Hamiltonian that corresponds to drive i, differentiate with respect to time, take the expectation value in the instantaneous uh, state, and integrate over time. That's the integral of the power uh, of each of the sources. Now, psi of t is, of course, the time evolved, uh, the time evolved state from an initial state that's initialized into a particular uh, state in your uh, effective band structure, an effective two-dimensional band, uh, band structure. Now you want to be in the limit of strong driving and slow uh, and, and small frequencies, so omega should be smaller than the B and M that appear in the Hamiltonian. What this achieves is that if you start um, what this achieves is that this wave function psi will be spread 
over several photon numbers, right? Because the photon energies that you get is proportional to omega. It's much smaller than the amplitude of the Hamiltonian. Then you can uh, be in a superposition of several photons absorbed. And now the motion is going to be perpendicular to the vector omega in a particular direction that depends on how you initialize the state. So for in the, if you uh, initialize your psi to be in the low energy state of the instantaneous Hamiltonian, say minus psi t of epsilon k of t, then you move in one direction. If you initialize to the opposite state, then you move in the other direction. So this is the kind of simulation that we carried out. Sorry, here's, here's the proper equation for the initialization. H naught of psi naught should be, say, minus epsilon k naught of psi naught. And here are the results. So if you start looking at the incommensurate frequency case, then over time you'll cover the entire Brillouin zone in your motion. You'll average over the very curvature of the entire tube of the entire band. And here's what we get for the work. On the <coughs> this is a com each color here gives you the work that the energy or the work done by the two drives. This is one drive. This is the second drive. Here's the energy on the y-axis, here's time on the x-axis, and these uh, different colored curves correspond to different values of m, where m equals 2 is the transition from uh, topological to trivial. Uh, and what you can see is that the rate of work is really, seems to be always the same as before you go into non-topological state. <coughs> now, if you uh, consider what's going on here, you see that for m equals 1.2, 1.4, 1.6, you have this nice pumping. However, when you go to 1.8, still in the topological phase, you stop having nice pumping. Of course, the reason for that is the question that was raised before. As you're driving your spin, if you're driving it too fast compared to the band gap, you'll start losing fidelity. Your spin will go from the lower band to the upper band and will start pumping in the opposite direction. And here's the fidelity uh, of your spin. It's perfect at one, so these are uh, the fidelities, but shifted at one for each realization. So in the first three cases, fidelity is perfect at one, it coincides with the one, but then for uh, closer to the phase transition, the fidelity gets lost because the gap becomes smaller, and then we see the loss of the pumping effect. And here's the power pump. Here's the quantized value. As long as the fidelity is good, we're very close to the quantized value, and then it decays to zero as we go to the non-topological phase. So this is the effect. It seems to appear. If you want to, you can make a phase diagram. You can change the strength of the drive as well. So this is the strength of the drive in this axis, the parameter m over here, going from zero to uh, minus two, zero to two are the topological regions. And we see that the <coughs> as you go to stronger and stronger drive, you get the topological regions to have the quantized pumping that you would expect. Uh, now, you can also ask the same question for commensurate frequencies. Let me skip it. Uh, let me go through it very quickly. In this case, you don't average over the Brillouin zone, and you can have pumping effects that prevail even beyond uh, where the topological phase of the static model stops. Because you don't average over the entire Brillouin zone, you don't see the, uh, the churn number. You just see a coincidental combination of uh, Berry curvatures. And of course, that pumping will depend on the initial phase between your two drives. So as you change the initial phase difference between the two drives, you'll get different uh, pumping as well. All this goes away when you introduce temporal noise. When you have temporal noise, you'll again average over the entire Brillouin zone. And if you don't have the topological phase, you don't have protection against temporal noise, and then the pumping will disappear. But in the topological phase, even with temporal noise, you have pumping that's quantized. Uh, now, the last thing I want to talk about, maybe in the remaining zero minutes, uh, is what happens when we quantize the field. So let's think about now replacing one of the laser modes with a cavity. So here's uh, the doubly driven system with uh, two classical beams. Let's take beam number two, this V2 and V2, and turn it into a truly uh, quantum mechanical mode, A dagger minus A replaces the sine omega t, A dagger plus A replaces the cosine. And now we have the spin confined into an optical cavity, irradiated with omega 1, and maybe it emits 
an omega-2, which is a mode in the band, a mode in the cavity. So now we really have a large Hilbert space because now the number of photons in the cavity is a true quantum number. It's a true part of the Hilbert space. And we need to consider the motion in this much larger Hilbert space. It's no longer really a Floquet. Uh, it's no longer really a Floquet problem. And here, if you think about what B2 is, so B2 is over here, but now it gets multiplied by the square root of the number of photons. So now we need to think about the phase diagram between topological and trivial that has to do with B1, right, the strength of, drive, of the drive, but then the number of photons in the cavity. And depending on the number of photons, you can go uh, between trivial and topological. Right? Because when N2 is 0, then you know, B1 is effectively 0. But when N2 is very large, sorry, uh, B2 is effect when N2 is 0, uh, B2 is effectively 0. And since B2 is proportional to square root of N2, as the number of photons grows, right, you're exploring larger and larger coupling to your drive effectively. Uh, so you can go in and out of a topological phase depending on the number of photons, which I think is something that Anatoly was mentioning. What happens in this case, if we simulate this system, depending on what you choose for B1, you can be in a state that starts off with no photons in the trivial case, goes into a topological phase, if you simulate that, this is what it looks like. Here's the number, so this axis is the number of photons in the cavity mode. This is time. If we start off with some number of photons that's in between the boundaries of the topological phase, you see you get quantized pumping in one direction, then it switches, switches back, switches back. Every time it switches, it loses some probability, but you still get this topological, quant uh, this topological uh, pumping, quantized pumping between the laser and the mode. Uh, <clears throat> and then another question to ask, what happens when you put your system in a place where the topological phase applies all the way from zero photons in the mode? And this is this case. So when you have too many photons, you go trivial, but then all, the, uh, all this range is in the topological phase of the system. If you start off with some large number of photons, you can pump them down to zero, but then you can recover. And you can even start with zero photons in the cavity, driven, and you'll get topological pumping that fills up the cavity up to the edge of the topological phase, in which case you'll get a reflection. But you can see that if you now uh, introduce um, a term in your uh, Hamiltonian, or you, you make this into a, now when you introduce a loss term, in your Hamiltonian that allows photons to leave the cavity, you can just place yourself somewhere here and get quantized pumping into uh, the mode that then emits like a laser in a frequency that you wish to have that's determined by the cavity, not by the uh, drive. All right, so, <coughs> so we have this effect. And then this system does things that we don't really understand yet. Uh, surprising, for instance, if you start over here, Sometimes there's a range of parameters in this uh, region that will result in some new periodicity appearing, actually three times the period of your drive. So in this case, this is one example of such a snake state. And you can get other examples of these snake states. They're very robust. And <coughs> for some reason, the system introduces period tripling. And here's the Fourier transform of this. So if you want, this system also have not just a quasi-time crystal, but maybe a true time crystal. Of course, I'm tongue-in-cheek, because this is a usual effect that happens in uh, parametric resonances. And this period tripling turns out to be associated with a uh, chaotic system. If you have periodic period tripling in a system, it means that uh, you can have any period multiplication, and the system has chaotic regions in it. Anyway, so this was a bit of uh, a flavor of what happens when we quantize uh, one of the fields, and this was the work of Frederick Nathan. And with that, maybe it's time to conclude. So <coughs> in this double frequency drive, we see multiple drives could induce topological effect in, even in a zero dimensional system. We get topological frequency conversion, quantized energy pumping. You can think about it as a possibly a new paradigm for an optical parametric uh, amplifier. We, we need to talk about frequency ranges in, this, in which this applies. We don't know how to make it apply in, apply in uh, optical ranges. Uh, 
experimental realizations, you can think about spins, qubits, maybe cavities with rare earth garnets, maybe irradiating vile semi-metals. And of course, there are several open questions that you can ask here.